Lord, we began in silence this morning, preparing ourselves to have a fresh encounter with you, not even knowing what that would mean. And we've worshipped you in song. And we've celebrated our dads and our lives and our relationships. And we've shared what's going on in the life of your church and ways for us to be your real hands and feet in this world. And we've given back to you from what you've given to us. And now we open your word and our greatest hope is that you would use it to speak to us. I ask that the words of my heart and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you, O oh God. I ask it in the time that remains that you would meet each of us in the place that we most deeply need to be met. That you would lead us from this place into the next with a stronger sense of your awareness and an understanding of what it is that you want for us in our lives. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have been in this series called Finding Our Way for this is the eighth week. 10 week series and we've been walking through the book of Ephesians and the idea behind the series was what happens when you lose your way you know there are times in your life where you're moving along and things seem clear they seem crisp, they're moving as you would want them to be or at least relatively close and then before you know it, inexplicably you find yourself in some stuck place, some lost place, some place you have no idea how you got there or how you're going to find your way back. And the idea behind this letter, at least thematically the way I've been unpacking it for you, is the Apostle Paul is writing to a group of people who lost their way. He'd invested his life for three years with this group of people. And time passed, about five years. He's in a jail cell in Rome and he's writing to this church because he's caught wind that, that they really have gone astray from the things that he had taught them, the ways that he had instructed them, and it concerns him greatly. It's like when anybody that you care deeply about has taken a wrong turn and is moving in a direction, literally heading towards destruction, it concerns you. So he writes this letter and he is pleading with them in the first three chapters to remember who they are. Because more often than not, the only reason that we make a wrong turn and get lost is because we lose a sense of that. It happens in any number of different ways, but nevertheless it happens. We lose some sense of who we are, whose we are, and what kind of life we're called to live. And that's what happened here. And so for three chapters he unpacks that for him. And he, he doesn't even get into behaviors. He just says, just remember who you are. You are God's workmanship created for greatness. When God found you, you were spiritually dead. But he has made you alive with Christ. And he has given you all these gifts. And he has blessed you and he has called you to a new way of living. So he's reminding them. And then when we hit chapter 4, which is where we've been for the last several weeks, he just walks through these behaviors that are just incompatible with him. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't, he doesn't try to make them feel worse than perhaps they already feel, but he points out to them by saying X and Y and Z. These things, they're just, they're not compatible with the life of one who calls themselves by the name of Christ. So he points out to them things that they're to see and then things that they're to do and so last week when we were towards the end of chapter 4, I gave you two pieces of homework by a show of hands. How many of you guys were here? Okay. So if you were not here, the homework does not apply to you. How could it? But for those of you who were, it does. And I hope that you won't feel nervous about now because who knows what I might do when I give you homework and it's time to collect. But there were two basic things that I asked of you to do. Because... If we just 
spend this time and you're just learning something but you don't do anything with it, of what value is that? It's a very little value. We're not trying to produce people who know a lot. We're hoping that God will, by His grace, as we cooperate with Him, um, lead us into a greater level of maturity and that we will become disciples of Christ, followers, students, learners of His. And so the first thing that I asked you came from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let's take a look at that just kind of as a reminder. And I want you to think about whether or not you did your homework because when you show up to class and you haven't done your homework, when you were in school, you, you got an F, right? You, there was no second chance. I, I'm a little more generous than perhaps some of your old teachers may have been. I'm going to give you a second chance because, you know, I can give you this homework uh, for the rest of your life. It could be something that needs to be worked on. So, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, it says, If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. And we looked at that and we're like, a thief? And then we talked about all the ways that we steal. Right? You remember that? We talked about all the ways that we steal. We're at work and we're doing stuff that has nothing to do with work. We're making personal calls. We're running personal errands. We're stealing from the people who are paying us, who are employing us in our job. Or we come home and we bring work with us and we steal from our families because we're sitting around the table and our kids are on their phones talking with other people and we're in the other room when we've been called to dinner on the computer, <coughs> answering emails and doing work. We do it all the time, don't we? We steal from one another. And so our homework was, listen, I, I was giving you something to do. I said, if there is an individual or a group of people that you know in your heart you have stolen from, then I want you to find a way to give something back. The idea is, we're called not to be people who take, but to be people who give. We're called to be generous people, like the most generous one that we follow. And the only way that you and I become more generous is by actually doing things that take us down the path. We become more generous by being more generous. And so I just want you to think about, did I, did I do my homework? Did I, did I think of someone or some group of people that maybe I had been taking from and intentionally give something back? I hope that you did, but if you didn't, you have more homework this week. Keep at it, okay? Homework number two was found in verse 29 of chapter 4. The first thing was something we do. The next thing was something we said. It says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. We live in a very discouraging world. There's a lot of things that are going on that are swirling in our lives, and not only do we get discouraged, but so do others around us. And I was challenging you last week that our words have great potential either to build up or to tear down. <clears throat> And so I invited you, I challenged you, I gave you some homework to intentionally choose somebody to build up. Now our little construction projects, they, they don't happen overnight, right? So if, if somewhere along the way in trying to build somebody up, they don't get it, they don't appreciate it, they don't receive it well, we don't lose heart, we don't give up, because we know that some things take longer than just one word, one phrase, one time. So I hope this past week that you thought about a person or people, because certainly God knows there are enough people in our sphere of influence who are discouraged for one reason or another that we can speak a kind word to. And we talked about all the different ways that we can encourage and build up. I won't go into that. But I hope that you did that. And if you didn't do that, well, again, I'll give you another chance. I hope you'll do that. May we be a people who intentionally give ourselves to making life better for other people. <coughs> life isn't just always about us. <coughs> if we can look outside of ourselves sometimes and realize that there are people who are struggling and who could use a good word. 
then maybe we might be the first to get it. So anyway, that was one more class week. This week we continue on in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to finish the chapter and make our way into chapter 5. If you will, and you have a Bible, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to read the very first verse and then stop for a second and make a little bit of commentary. This is the Apostle Paul, two people who have lost their way. He writes, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Now, when I, when I hear that, when I think about that instruction, the one word that stands out to me is all. Right? Because sometimes when we feel this way, when we have some level of bitterness and rage and anger, this is how we feel. The harsh words and, and the slander, those are, those are how, what we do with how we do it. Right? So it's our feelings and it's our actions. But sometimes when we're feeling this way, we feel right in these feelings, don't we? When we are angry when we are bitter, when we are harsh, we do so for a reason. We don't just do it for no reason. It's not as, as, as if we just wake up and we think it's a good idea to feel that way and to act that way. And so, when we hear this word, get rid of all, I, I think of two questions, really. I think of, well, the first thing that I think about is, why should I get rid of all of this when I'm right about some of this? You know what I mean? Now if I asked you, how many of you guys think it's a good idea to hold bitterness and anger and, and just a mean-spiritedness within us? If I asked you, how many of you thought it would be a good idea for our mental and emotional and spiritual health? How many of you would raise your hand and say, you know what, I think there is occasion where it's actually a good idea. <laughs> justified in the feelings you have or even the things you say, but the truth of the matter is why would we ever do such a thing? I just want you to think about that. It's a rhetorical question, but if you think about it, it might cause you to examine why it is that you do. The second question I'm confronted with is how? Alright, I get that this is a bad idea. I don't really want to be this way. I don't want to feel this way. I didn't want to say those things or do those things. And yet, I just can't help myself. Right? Just can't help myself. I mean, if you only knew, and fill in the blank, you feel justified somehow. You get that it's a bad idea. So how am I supposed to not do this? I mean, the Apostle Paul makes it sound so easy, right? Just get rid of it, like it's taking garbage to the curb or something. You know, all that anger and that bitterness and that hard-heartedness and those foul words and abusive language, just get rid of it. Now, if somebody gave you advice like that, what do you do with that? Sometimes you become angrier at the person who gave you the advice, right? <laughs> Let's unpack and go to verse 32, though, because he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you why, and he's going to tell you how. Okay? He said, instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So get rid of all this junk. How? By doing the opposite. It's a bit counterintuitive, right? So that person that you're angry at, that you're bitter at, that you're unforgiving towards, actually, why don't you just try being kind to them? What? <laughs> now, how many of you like this instruction? This feels good, doesn't it? Here's what happens. You're going down a road. It's a hard-hearted road. You're angry, you're bitter, and it's piling up. And this is the road you're on. And basically what he's saying is, turn around and go in the opposite direction. Repent. Change your mind, change your way. You say, well, I feel like a phony. 
I mean, I can't stand this person, and you want me to be kind towards them? And Paul said, yeah, I do. That's what I, that's what I want. He said, well, how can I do that? And he said, well, by remembering who you are. And by remembering who you are. Do you remember when God found you, what condition you were in? You were dead, spiritually. The light was off. There was nothing alive in your spirit. You were totally left for dead. Do you remember that? Most of the time I say, not enough. Because if I did, I wouldn't be feeling this way towards this person. See, part of our being able to be kind towards others who hurt us is being in touch with our own humanity. And the truth of the matter is, when God found us, we were dead. We were cut off from His grace. And so what He's trying to do is to remind them to say, you know what? They did some terrible things. But it's not like you've gone through this life without doing some of your own. And I'm not saying that that makes it all better. But I'm just saying it gives you a perspective. Because why, if you could do so terribly, would you not allow for the possibility that there's somebody else who does the same? It just happened to you. And that's why it feels the way it does. So he says, rather than continuing on the path that you're on, why don't you just turn around and do the opposite? Why don't you be kind to them? And so as he continues... He reminds them, he says, the bottom line is, you do this because God through Christ has forgiven you. We're so grateful. When we take communion and we, we're mindful that Christ gave his life and his all, his body and his blood for us, and we come and we receive the elements, we're so grateful, aren't we? And it's amazing how fleeting that gratitude gets. When we walk out these doors and somebody does something or says something to us, that's not kind. That is hurtful. So all he's saying is, you want to receive this forgiveness, you want this grace applied to you, well then you have to apply it to others. You can only give to somebody what you have. And you have this. Remember who you are. Now, before we go any further, I just want to make a point about what forgiveness is not than what forgiveness is. Because I think sometimes in our mind we think, I can't possibly forgive this person for having done this, for having said this. And let me just share with you what I believe forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not trusting someone. You don't forgive somebody uh, simply because you believe they're never going to do again. It's not being engaged in a relationship where you're trusting that person not to harm you. Forgiveness is not trust. They're two different things. Okay? Forgiveness is also not reunion. Just because you forgive somebody doesn't mean that you're going to be in relationship with them in the same way you were before the event happened. It would be nice, but it's not two of the same thing. And forgiveness is not restoration. It does not mean that that person is completely restored to the same standing that they had before. It means none of those three things. So for those of you who are trying to get in touch with what forgiveness is and isn't, um, there are steps before we get to restoration and reconciliation, but forgiveness and those are not the same. You can forgive somebody without trusting them. And you can forgive somebody without being reconciled in your relationship to them. You can. Okay? This is what I believe forgiveness is. I don't think forgiveness is trust, I don't think it's reunion, and I don't think it's restoration. But I do believe that forgiveness is rediscovering another person's humanity. You know when a person hurts us, somehow in our minds, they become the sum total of the thing they did to us? But the truth of the matter is, a person is more than that. They're more than just that thing they did to us. And so sometimes our perspective is so narrow, that's all we see. Forgiveness is getting to a place where you can rediscover that, like you, that person is a human being too. And that more than just being that bad, evil thing they did, they are actually more than that. 
What happens is your perspective gets broad as it's not tightened down on just the thing they did to you. You can begin to see them in a different light. And it's going to be important to see that person in a different light if you are to give up the hard-heartedness and the angry, bitter feelings that you have towards them. They're human. And part of the process of forgiving another person is rediscovering that person's humanity. Okay? Second thing is, in the process of learning to forgive somebody, is surrendering our right to get even. Eye for an eye, right? Lex Talionis, that was the law that Jesus spoke to in our last series. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, right? Remember, we were learning the way of Jesus. He's given us a different way. We have to, in the process of forgiveness, surrender our right to get you. Justice and vengeance are two different things. Justice is when a person gets what really they deserve. Vengeance is your delight and enjoyment over that fact. Right? <laughs> Two different things. <clears throat> God is a God of justice. But we don't have to feel so juicy over the fact of this person getting what they deserve and delighting it. Because if we get what we deserve, right, it won't quite feel the same way, will it? So, part of the process of forgiving somebody is rediscovering a person's humanity, surrendering our rights to get even. And then eventually, this is kind of the last piece to it, revising our feelings towards that person uh, who has hurt us to the point where someday we actually wish them well. We might not ever want to be in a relationship with them again. We might not ever trust them with anything that matters to us. But someday, as God works His grace through our lives, we can actually wish that person well and release them. That's where we want to be because until we get to that place, we're jumped up with all the stuff that Paul says you need to get rid of. Forgiveness is good for the other person, but it's probably even better for you. Unforgiveness and hardness of heart does not serve you well in any way, and it is not compatible with being one who is a follower of the Christ, who from the cross of his own death forgave the very people who nailed him. So when you're in that place, you say, well, you don't understand. Well, you can never say that about the Christ. No one understands any greater than Jesus Christ what it means to feel betrayed, denied, mocked, beaten, scourged, persecuted, judged. Nobody understands any better than the one you follow. And he calls you to a different way calls me to a different way. And when we walk in that way, we return back towards home, towards the life he calls us to. And so what I want to do this week, your homework assignment, boy, it's building up now, <laughs> is I, I want you to think about someone in your life that you don't have good feelings towards. That maybe your relationship has been fractured. Maybe you had an exchange where you said something or did something as a result of something they said or did towards you, and it's just it's just not good. Just one word. <laughs> <laughs> you start small. I don't want to overwhelm you. <laughs> but here, here's what I would say. There are categories, right? There are some categories of people that we're so estranged from we can't imagine how we'll ever get to the place of doing that. Don't start there. Maybe just start someplace lesser along the way where there was a lesser injury or a lesser offense. Start with a place that's easier that gets you back on track. You'll work up to graduate level loving eventually <laughs> if you stay on the path. But I want you to think about a way that you could actually be kind towards that person this week. They might not respond at all. They might think you have a hidden motive or an ulterior motive. They might not receive, they might totally reject it and actually expect it. 
you're not looking for results. You're looking to get back on the right track, moving in the right direction where you don't have hard as hard. So I want you to think about someone. And if, if you're one of those fortunate, blessed people who at this time in your life cannot imagine anybody that you're at odds with or that you have something against, then thank God for where you are and maybe pray for somebody else that you know who does maybe does have a need in that regard. Okay. So that's your homework for number one. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Here's an easy one. Imitate God. <laughs> All right. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are His dear children. Imitate God. Now, I know a lot of people who think they're God. But I don't really think that's what he's getting at, an overinflated ego. I don't think that's really what he's wanting. I want you to think about when you're going to imitate somebody, what imitation requires. Like, so, I used to do this all the time when I was a kid and I was playing baseball and there were guys that I would look at and emulate and I would want to be like them and I would look at their swing and how they stood and where their hands were and all that. I had to do something when I was thinking about imitating them. Now, baseball might not be your deal, but there might be something else. Maybe you're a musician or, or maybe you're a cook or you know, maybe there's something else that you do and you've seen somebody in a field that you care about and you think to yourself, I'd really like to be more like that person, right? And so part of what getting to be more like that person is, is you have to study that person. You have to think about what they do. You have to get to know who they are before you practice it. Imitation requires a few things of us. Imitation requires, I think, above all else, though, intention. Because I can look at somebody else and I can think about what they do and I can appreciate where they are, but until I intentionally do the things that they do, I don't become like them. So if I am to imitate God, if we are to imitate God, you know what? That's not going to happen by accident. I just got to tell you, I've lived 47 years at this point. Most of my spiritual, spiritual formation and growth has not come by drifting into it. It hasn't happened on accident. It's happened because I realized there was something in my life that wasn't as it should be. And I looked at how I might, with God's help, make a change in my direction and apply energy towards doing something different. The Christian faith is a very disciplined walk. You're never going to stumble into maturity. You're never going to drift into becoming like God. It doesn't happen that way. You might know that, but if you don't, I just want to make you aware of that, okay? Imitation requires intention. Imitate God how? Where? In everything you do. Wow. That's homework for the rest of our lives. Imitate God in all that you do. And then he says, verse 2, Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So imitate God, live a life filled with love, follow the example of Christ. All of these are what? <clears throat> They're choices. that we make or we don't make. <clears throat> Imitate God, live a life filled with love, follow the example of Christ. And to make all of those choices, what is required in those instances is sacrifice. Live a life, picture this, picture you, live a life filled with love. That means if my heart, if my life is filled with love, you know what it doesn't have room for? Bitterness and hardness of heart and unforgiveness and slander and gossip and pride. 
Should I keep going on and on? To live a life filled with love means that if I have, if here's my life, and this much is love, there's still this much that isn't. So the goal is to get rid of all the stuff that isn't love. Now some of us are close, and some of us are not. Some of us have only just about 15% love. There's about 85% other stuff in there. All of us got some love. But wherever it is that we are and wherever percentage we find ourselves at, we are given instruction about what we can do to continue to fill our lives. But really, the question becomes, will we? And in order to do it, it requires sacrifice. Do you know why? Because mostly, we're just self-centered. Mostly, we're just looking out for ourselves. Mostly, we will do things so long as it benefits us. That's how it is most of the time with most of us. And so that's why when Paul, after Paul says that in verse 2, he says the following things. It makes perfect sense. He says, let there be no sexual immorality or impurity or greed among you. Um, such sins have no place among God's people. When you love somebody, you are other-centered. But when we're talking about greed and sexual impurity and immorality, it's all about you. It's all about fulfilling the lust of your own flesh. It has nothing to do with the other person. And he says, that stuff just doesn't belong because it's leading you away from a life that's filled with love. And, and he continues. He said, there are other things. He says, the obscene stories, the foolish talk, the coarse jokes, they're not for you either. He said, instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Why do you keep talking about all that junk? It's just filling your life with stuff that's not loving. It's sarcastic. It's bitter. It's rude. It's not love. He said, let your life be filled with love. And he said, as it is, be thankful, be grateful to God that he's doing a new redeeming work in you. Something's going to fill you. What's it going to be? So to make excuses for why we're angry for the person, you can make excuses until the cows come home and if you feel justified, that's great. But every time you do, that level of love dips just a little bit lower. That's, that's just the truth. Live a life filled with love. He moves his way through and he talks about what it means to live as a person of the light because once we were steeped in darkness, he, talk, he goes on and he talks about not participating in the things that everybody else around you does. He says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. As you live in the light, what comes out are gifts, fruits of God's Spirit in you. So if that's not coming out, guess what? Somewhere along the way, there's a blockage in flow. And you've got to tend to that so that what comes out is a blessing and not a curse. Take no part in the worthless, worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, he says, expose them. Don't isolate yourself. You know, sometimes we make these choices where we say, well, you know, this world that we live in is so evil and bad and dark and whatever. And we decide, well, we're just gonna we're just gonna limit our interaction with the world. Uh -uh, don't do that. Why would you isolate yourself when you have light? And when there is such great darkness that is around you, why would you not then expose darkness with your light? Why would you not reveal to others a better way? Not from a place of pride, but from a place of humility, where you're helping others who are stumbling in the dark to come out. If you were in the dark, wouldn't you want somebody with a little light to help show you the way? I mean, really. Have you ever been in a very dark place? 
What's the thing you most need when you're in a dark place? Light. Paul says, you have the light in you. Let it shine. Live a life that's filled with love. And as you live that life that's filled with love, can't you imagine that that's going to impact people who most desperately need that? You don't drift into a life that's pleasing to God. It doesn't happen by accident. We're swimming against kind of the cultural tide, and it is exceedingly strong. You ever swam against the tide? It's not an easy thing to do. It's a powerful thing to do. That's why it requires intention. It requires practice. It requires the development of muscles that you might not yet have. But you're not going to succeed unless you give yourself to it. Illumination, not isolation. And then he finishes with the following things, and this is where we'll stop today. Verse 11, he says, Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness, instead expose them. And then moving down to verse 15, he says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Be careful how you live. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Honestly, when you're making your decisions, like everyday decisions in life, how many of you actually think, I wonder what God wants me to do? Is that like part of the dialogue that goes on in your head, or is that just not even come into play? I mean, I know sometimes when we get to those major life decisions, should I marry this person? Should I take this job? Should I move here? Big decisions, we think, well, maybe God should factor in on that. But just everyday stuff, do we just think to ourselves, gosh, I wonder what God would want me to do in this situation. Paul says, don't be foolish. God wants in on all your life. He wants to direct your path. He wants to lead you home. If you've lost your way, it's because maybe perhaps you've stopped asking yourself the question, what would God want me to do in this particular situation? Because, you know, to get lost, all it takes is one step in the wrong direction, and then you just stay down that path for a while. All it really takes is one little turn off. That's it. And then 20 years later, you wonder how you got so far. So it's just one turn. Followed by another step, another step, and another step. So, homework number two is I want you to be thoughtful this week. I want you to be careful in your decision making. I want you every time you're posed with making a decision that's in your consciousness to ask God, God, what do you want me to do? Now, I know that some of you are thinking, I know I'm going to ask that question, but like, what if God actually answers me? God's voice and He leads you. If you're too busy, if you're too stressed, if you don't have the time, it is very much more difficult to hear God with all of the swirl in your life. But what I have found is that if you create the space to listen for God's voice, you will understand that He's always speaking to you. He's the good shepherd you are in His shepherd. He longs to guide you and lead you into great pastures. That's what he wants for you. So yes, Jane, yes, the answer is yes. How that occurs, what that sounds like, what that feels like, I can't give you a template for that. You will just know that you know when you have created the space and opened your heart that God is leading. 
be a whole other series of sermons to tell you about how to do that. But just trust me that if you can begin to ask the question and be intentional towards asking God, what do you want me to do here? It will develop a habit that will take you in the right direction. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about finding our way back home. Because many of us get lost along the way. So don't be foolish, he said. Don't try to live life under the strength of your own resources. Turn to him. Lean on his strength. And be careful and intentional about what you do. Okay? Two pieces of homework, you got it? I'm going to ask you again next week. Okay? Let's pray.